All right, so if you're unaware, uh, my name is Jonathan Hollerman. If you'd like to know more about me and my background, please go down and click the, in the description below, and there is, will be a link to my bio, and it kind of gives you a feeling for who I am and what I do and uh, the, the reason why I have the experience and the expertise to, to make the claims I'm going to make in this video. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the video. So... Twenty twenty has been a wake-up call for many Americans, showing how things can quickly take a turn for the worse. We experienced prosperity and calm for quite some time before this year, but we've quickly seen how that can change. One disaster or perceived calamity can cause panic. More than one catastrophe at the same time could lead to a prolonged grid-down situation. While the region might recover after a few days or weeks, a national incident could leave you on your own with no help coming. If a significant enough event were to occur that completely disrupted our supply chains and resources, the results would be catastrophic. Most people don't have enough food or water on hand to survive much more than a week. In this video, we'll cover sure. what you can expect when a national disaster over 90 days occurs and how you can prepare now. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter to give you up. Okay, so this is really important. So this particular video and it's, in, it's important because there's many different types of prepping channels online. Uh, this particular video, he's specifically stating that this is an event, a catastrophic societal level national event that takes place longer than 90 days. So that's important to remember. Uh, so when you're building a plan of action, a survival plan of action, a preparedness plan, uh, you always want to know what you're preparing for and why. So it's important at the beginning of this video that he states it's more than 90 days and it's a societal collapse event. Dates and membership specific content. Visit www.cityprepping.com forward slash newsletter or click on the link in the description and comment section below to subscribe today. Enjoy the video. So as with all my videos, I always say... Um, Make sure you know where you're getting your advice from and what are their qualifications for giving you said advice. So uh, this particular gentleman, I've looked at his website. Uh, his peak expertise was being a former Eagle Scout. Uh, at the end of the day, he his channel City Prepping is for people that want to be prepared but that live in the city, okay? Now, there are many different survival preparedness events where you could survive in a city. An extended event, a grid down event, national event, where there's no food, no water, no no law enforcement. Uh, that's a different story, in my opinion. If you follow me for any length of time, uh, city prepping, in my opinion, is a, is an oxymoronic statement. Uh, I don't believe that trying to survive long term in the city is a viable option for for an extended event. Any disaster on a national or global scale can quickly turn neighbor against neighbor. The calm social order you enjoy will be flipped on its head just after a few days. The sad reality is that most people aren't prepared to survive to next week if supplies were cut off, let alone for 90 days or more. There is, however, a timeline that generally follows disasters. Knowing this timeline can put you one step ahead of the herd and keep you safer amidst the chaos. This so that's true. Understanding how society is going to fall apart, the timeline it's so critical. And that's the reason I'm, I'm doing a live reaction to this video. I, I have not seen the video uh, before. It's just one of the most popular prepping uh, videos on this topic. But understanding the operating environment you're going to be surviving in is, is key to making any kind of plan. You have to know what you're getting into before you start making a plan of where to go, what to do, when to stay, when to go, things like that. This video will analyze the days, weeks, and months following a catastrophic national disaster. I'll tell you what you can expect along the way and provide you with solutions you will need to remain safe and survive. The first three days. Depending on the national disaster, the first 24 hours can be relatively calm. If you're in the aftermath of a storm or an earthquake, this is a period where people are emerging from what is left of their shelters and making sure they are unscathed. If it's a disaster like a national power outage, most people are still relatively calm. We put a great deal of faith in our government, public services, guard, and military to restore our world following a disaster. So that's actually true. Uh, while a nationwide extended blackout would be a, the worst case scenario for this country, uh, it would be horrific. It is true that the first 24 hours are going to be relatively calm. 
There may be certain areas in certain inner city neighborhoods where things fall apart pretty quickly when they realize that the power's out and the, 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 the police radios aren't working, things like that. You, you may get some kind of uh, looting and rioting. Uh, but I, w- I wouldn't even say rioting. Maybe some, some looting the first night. But for the first 24 hours, I would agree it's probably going to be pretty calm. This period of calm can last for about two days. After that, things begin to reveal how broken they really are. Stores that cannot process credit and debit transactions cannot sell to people without cash. And banks that cannot process deposits and withdrawals stop functioning. So, so that's a key point, and he's correct. Uh, a lot of times in kind of preparing this fiction, there's always like some grocery store manager that's there four days after the event and there's a police officer standing next to her and they're selling people, you know, $50 worth of food from the grocery store at a time. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. That's, that's never going to happen. The, a manager has no vested interest in that store. Uh, there's, there's no way to really track things or ring things. They don't care. Uh, they're not going to be there. So once the stores close on the night of uh, day one uh, out of an extended grid down event, they're never going to reopen. They're just not. Just-in-time delivery services that replenish grocery and pharmacy inventories can't do so, and shortages of some items begin to occur. This fuels even more panic buying, which further exacerbates the problem. After 72 hours, people will begin to realize that help is not coming and systems will not be restored. The stress level of the community will start to boil over. If stores haven't been looted yet, it will surely begin by the third day, as those who fail to prepare will desperately try to grab up the resources they now realize they need. So, so again, this this is pretty accurate information. I would say in, in the the inside the cities, they're probably going to get looted by the end of day two, probably day three. Uh, if you're in like some small farming village somewhere in rural America, you know you may get to day four before things start, before people start looting. If you have prepared, you can avoid being caught up in this dangerous time of desperation. Yep. If you have not, expect to be stuck with the herd making runs on stores. Likely, the police will not be able to keep ahead of the crime. Local curfews will be established, perhaps even martial law. Okay, so in the case of a grid down event, you have to you have to realize the if it's an EMP, many of the police cruisers may not be functioning. But even outside of an EMP, if it's a solar flare, cyber attack against the grid, uh, physical attack against the grid, it's an extended blackout situation. It's going to last a very long time. The police radios don't work. Their jail cells probably don't work. Uh, the, the phones don't work. The, the, the judge probably isn't coming in. Uh, how long, how are they going to feed people? There's no water in the jail. There's no, the septic's not working. So these patrol officers are going to go out on patrol. And if they arrest somebody, they're not going to be able to call for backup. If they do arrest people. I mean, assuming that the jails aren't electric, uh, they, they put them in the cell, but for how long for, for, for what? I mean, things are going to fall apart so fast. I would anticipate by day two, day three at the most, most police officers, again, in the big cities, are going to just throw up their hands and stop coming into work. No radio is functioning. Like I said, they're, they're not going to be able to communicate. And I mean, 911 isn't working. The, 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 the phones aren't working. So you can't call for a police officer. They're going to be just be roaming around looking for uh, targets of opportunity. So at some point, they're going to realize that Things are just falling apart, and they're going to go home to be with their families and loved ones once the the, the rioting and the looting starts. What should you know about and do in the first 72 hours? Your first 24 hours is a little bit of a golden window for you to act. You'll need to decide if you're going to shelter in place or bug out. You should immediately fill every container you have with water. Okay, so if you follow me for anything like the time, a long-term grid down event, your initial reaction is to always get out of the city. Uh, mass population centers are going to be a death zone. Your chances of surviving in a city are very slim to none. My recommendation is always to get out on, uh, on very early in the morning of day two and get on the road and get to a safer location away from millions of starving and desperate people. Uh, but he's correct here as far as regardless of whether you're staying or leaving, uh, there's only so much water in the pipes in the city. So I would definitely fill as much y- your your tubs, water containers, get as much water as possible. Even if you can't carry it all with you, your neighbor who probably isn't a forward thinker is going to appreciate the fact that when they come to loot your house, there's a bunch of water there. So you're kind of paying it for it. And the likelihood that pumping stations will cease to operate. Your water may be gravity fed with those enormous tanks you see on the hillsides around your town. 
but those will not be replenished in a prolonged grid down situation. If possible, you should gas up your vehicle. Within the first 24 hours, if you need to go to the store, do so with cash if there's any supplies you need to top off. But again, only do this if you have no other option, as it is likely that people will be in a state of panic. So don't plan on this being your primary plan if you fail to prepare. So I, I agree. I, I don't think any of your big box stores, any of your point of sale, computer generated cash registers are not going to be functioning. Uh, they're not going to be able to open the drawer. But your little mom and pop st stores, your little mom and pop shops, uh, absolutely. I, I recommend having a, a, a pretty fair amount of cash on hand because you're not going to be able to access cash from the bank. The ATMs aren't going to be working. Uh, so any cash that you have on hand that first 24 hours, I would say the first three or four hours after the event happens, spend as much cash as possible before people realize that it's not, it's, it's not really worth anything. Evaluate accordingly based on the knowledge of your local stores. In the first 48 hours, you should check in with your mutual assistance group if you've established these types of relationships. If you live in an apartment complex, you should coordinate a floor or billing meeting to discuss posting guards at the entrances and other strategies to keep your billing safe. Though phone and internet services may be down, apps like Bridgeify that utilize mesh networks may still allow you to communicate with others or get news. CB or ham radios can provide you with critical communication abilities. A CB should be part of your prepping supplies because they are very affordable and vital to communication capabilities. You should also monitor your emergency radio channels to assess the extent and area radius of the disaster and base your decision on whether to bug out or bug in based upon this information. If you have a police scanner, you can monitor the chatter to determine how the disaster's aftermath is unfolding. Don't give too much credibility to the word of mouth rumors and gossip. Especially don't base your decisions on this type of communication. Assuming you have prepped. Okay, so a couple quick things. Uh, first off, uh, he was talking there about if, if you live in an apartment complex, uh, start a security detail. Get, get your neighbors on your floor lined up and, and, and you know, kind of get things started with your mutual assurance group with your apartment building. I, I would not do that. Okay, so first off, my recommendation is to, to leave. But if you start that, if you start down that road, if you start down the road of, hey, I'm, I'm going to be joining together with my, my neighbors and my apartment complex at some point, which we'll see where this goes. But once the food runs out, they're going to be coming for your food because, you, I mean, you know what you're talking about. You start giving orders and like, hey, organizing and stuff like that. The, I, I can guarantee you're the only one in your apartment building that, that has long term food in your apartment or in your subdivision on your cul-de-sac or, or, or like that. So I'd be careful with that. Uh, again, listening to chatter that, that you hear on the radio, uh, the, having ham radios as a prepper is kind of like a big thing. And everybody wants to have a ham radio and, and, and communicate with other prepper groups that are out there. I strongly, strongly advise against that. It's fine if you want to listen, but again, uh, government broadcasts, that are going to be coming across the airways. You're not going to know what to believe in, in this kind of scenario and uh, police chatter. Uh, th that would be kind of good to, to understand kind of where the threats are and kind of what the city's looking like and when you might want to leave. Uh, it's not a matter if you're going to leave, but when you're going to leave. And that's going to be within the first 24 hours, 48 hours max, especially if you're in a city. In advance, your most significant decision in the first 24 hours is going to be whether you should stay or go. Your window of opportunity will begin to close after the first 24 hours. Roads will begin to fill up and travel will likely not be a safe option any longer. So this is, this is important. If you don't get out early on in an event, because that's the thing is your, your home is your castle is your safe space. You have a bunch of food there. You got a bunch of stuff there. Uh, again, if you read any of my books, I highly recommend that you cache your supplies where you're going and not have all your food and, and your supplies and your guns and ammunition and everything you need to survive at your home location. You, the only thing you should really have there is your bug out bag and maybe a rifle and a handgun and, and some, some items like that, uh, because you're going to want to not believe it's going to be that bad and you're going to want to stay. But the problem is that you, I can't stress this enough. The, the, the common mentality in the prepper sphere here on YouTube is that stay there as long as you can. So, you know, just stay. And if it gets that bad, then travel, you're not getting it. You're not getting to your location. You're never going to make it if you wait too long. So you have to make that decision immediately. Get out early. Ask yourself, can I make it 90 days where I am? Even if the answer is yes, have a bug out plan and bag ready if the situation forces you out. Well, he just got done saying, 
that after a week or after three or four days, you're not going to be able to get out. So this idea that you bug in for 90 days, three months, you know, you have all this, your prepper food and your, your water filters and all this other, your seeds and your guns and ammunition, all this stuff. By the end of 90 days, probably a third of this country is going to be dead at that point. I mean, the, the violence is going to escalate so fast. The idea that you're going to wait 90 days and then travel, not a, not a plan of action. It's not. Your solutions for the first three days are to have some preps in place already, along with a bug out plan. All members of your network or family could implement the communication plan you've already put in place before the disaster. You should monitor any potential compounding problems like nuclear power plants or dams. Most importantly, nuclear power plants, huge thing. If you live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant, uh, you, you need, there's no question at that point, you must get out within the first week. Uh, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says they have seven days of backup diesel on site to keep the, the pumps running, the, the, the pumps to keep the, the, the rods cool and to keep the water pumping over the, the rods so they don't uh, boil over and, and basically go Fukushima. So if you are not out of there in seven days, uh, they have, because so, <laughs> I've sat in these meetings, they have a civilian contractor resupply diesel to 99 nuclear facilities in this country. That's just ridiculous. No, no civilian diesel tanker trucker is going to drive from Texas to Maryland to drop off fuel. They wouldn't even make it first off, but they're not going to, especially three or four days, they're not leaving their home seven days in. They're not, they're not driving cross country with a diesel tanker. It's just not going to happen. So uh, if you live within 50 miles of any kind of nuclear facility, you don't have an option. You must leave. You need to assess whether staying in location or getting to a safer area is possible, which is your best choice during this golden window of opportunity. The first week. Within the first week, supplies will be gone, either purchased or stolen. Medicines will begin to run out, and people with medicine-dependent lives will turn to hospitals for what they need. Hospitals may not be able to admit and help many people if their power cannot be restored. Police, medical, and fire services will be overwhelmed. And so again, all these things, if we're talking about an extended long-term event, grid down event, none of this stuff is functioning. Hospitals only have so much backup power. Uh, if they're the only ones in town with power, there's going to be, and it's winter, but a lot of people are going to be going there. Uh, a lot of people are going to be getting, there's going to be accidents, there's going to be injuries. They're going to have to walk to the hospital. Hospitals are going to be madhouses. Fire departments, there's no water pressure in the 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 in the ground for them to, to put out fires, to put out house fires. They're again, they're going to throw up their hands just like the police at some point and be like, there's nothing I can really do. I'm going to go home and be with my family, protect my family. So don't expect any kind of emergency medical facilities to be functioning after day three or four. And you cannot rely upon them. The declaration of martial law is very likely as governments attempt to keep the peace. As we saw this year, people will likely not accept martial law. Vigilante security groups will probably spring up in neighborhoods and Okay, I, I like where he's going here, but first, on the issue of martial law and the military, I have a report on my website. I've, I've linked to it in my books, and I've discussed it many times on Patreon. I, I mean, I have DOD reports. I've got numerous sources that can show you that 99% of the, the United States military bases re receive their electricity from the civilian electric grid. There are re I have a DOD report to Congress stating that in the event of a civilian grid down event, an extended grid down event, uh, they they have backup diesel generators on most military bases for 24 to 48 hours. That's it. Uh, I, I in my report, grid down definition, the psychology and phys physiology of human desperation, starvation, and living without rule of law, which I uh, is a white paper that I did for Electromagnetic Defense Task Force. Uh, I, I show there's no food on the military basis. It's not like back in the day. They get food shipments every two days, just like any grocery store, just like any town. They're going to run out of food. They're going to run out of electricity, just like anybody else. And that report specifically says the United States military will not be able to respond to societal collapse events. So the, like the picture you saw there with the box truck handing out MREs that you see in every Hollywood movie, it's never going to happen. Don't expect the military the government to show up. They're not showing up. Uh, I'd like to see where he's going to go here with the vigilante groups because that's where it's going to head. Communities. Clean water may cease to flow and trash and human waste will begin to pile up. As sewage plants fill, municipal water supplies or local rivers may become contaminated. Natural gas and electricity will cease to flow. By the end of the first week, the levels of circulating cash will be very low. 
and bartered items like food, water, and durable goods will begin to rise in value. People will be either trying. So again, I mentioned earlier, cash is going to lose its value right off the bat. Uh, your septic system is going to stop stop functioning very quickly. The water is going to stop functioning very quickly. Uh, basically, your house may become unlivable. Because something that a lot of these videos don't mention is, in most cities, as people continue to flush their toilets, when the septic facility down wind from them it, it stops functioning, the uh, the pressure builds up in the lines, and unless you have the long stake the key to go out there by your curb and and open the manhole and drop it down in there and and shut off your septic you could have raw sewage backing up into your house through your toilets through your sinks raw sewage that you have no control over especially if you're maybe at a lower elevation than some of the towns up at a higher elevation your house is going to become unlivable with 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 methane and feces just filling up your bathrooms you're not gonna the pressure gonna be too great from the toilet perspective you'd have to shut off the street and most people don't have that on hand to, to, to shut the septic off at the street trying to leave populated areas or for those stranded away from home when the disaster struck they will just be arriving back to their city home if they decide to return home to find that the landscape has changed considerably remember the golden window to either stay in place or bug out is really in the first 24 hours after that, you're competing with a herd every step of your journey. So, I mean, it, it, it's fairly accurate. So I would be hesitant to bug out the first, you know, it's not like sometimes you see in some of the videos where like everyone runs to grab their bug out bags and they literally hit the road within the first hour. I wouldn't do that because the cars and the people that are stranded on the highways have to get somewhere. You're going to be trying to navigate people walking on the highways and freeways and, and, and the side roads and on the sidewalks. You may have to get up on the sidewalk, to get around the intersection, maybe full of people. I would let the first day pass and let people get off the streets and get home. Uh, I always recommend my clients on basically not day zero, but the first day after the event, the early morning, like maybe an hour before dawn as the sun's for, you know, for just starting to get some dawn light in the sky. That's when I would make my escape from the city. I, I would not head out right away. And, you know, depending on the size, you know, if you're in New York city or Atlanta or Dallas, yes, that next morning, get out. If you're in a smaller town, 20, 30,000 people, 40,000 people, you might be able to stay there till day two and use those kind of first two days to, to uh, get some things together. Maybe the first day, get to the store, buy things that you maybe never got around to buying with the cash on hand. Uh, so that would be my recommendation there. Your solution for the first week is to take a mental inventory of your supplies and try to get all your family members or groups in one central defensible position. Do not share, even at community or billing meetings, the extent of your supplies. If you do, your supplies will likely be taken and divided up by the second week. You'll need to use... So key. I mentioned that at the beginning as far as organizing with your apartment complex or anything. First of all, you shouldn't be staying there. But if, if you give any hint that you might have stuff once week two, once week three hits and everybody else has run out of food and their kids are starving to death, they, they will come and take your stuff by force. Uh, so, you know, if somebody shows up at the end of week two and they're hungry, you know, I'm going to say at your survival retreat and not in the city because I've already said you should get out of the city. But let's say you have some older lady uh, that shows up, like a neighbor lady down the, the road, right? And she's got her, she's begging for food. She's hungry. Um, this may sound really cruel, but if you give her some food and, you know, you feel compassionate, and we all do, right? Uh, you feel compassionate for this old lady and you give her some food. You've only basically de delayed what's coming by one day. You've given her food for one day, okay? She will come back the next day and the next day, and at some point, you're going to have to stop giving her your kids food because you're basically feeding her out of the food that you put away for your children and your immediate family. So you will have to draw the line there at some point, um, and sh that person's going to probably be upset, and they're going to tell other people that you have food. And you know, when they start starving to death, I mean, their only option for food is the person that gave them food. So they're going to start talking to the other neighbors in town or the other neighbors and say, "Hey, so and so has food down there, and they're not sharing." right? Uh, so you run the risk anytime you give people food in this, no matter how like kind of sad the scenario is, 
Uh, unless you have the ability and you have enough food and you've got extra spots at your retreat where you can take them in, that person can live with you and you can supply their needs and they can stay with you and be part of your team, then take them in. But if you're just giving them a day's worth of food, I mean, this may sound, you're not really helping them. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're extending their survival by one day. um, And you're just, there's a lot of risk involved. Use a large bucket and trash bags to remove waste from your living area. If it's more than just you, a 24 hour watch system at your home must be established. The night will bring the greatest conflicts as desperate people will try to use the cloak of darkness to keep them hidden. Martial law or local police may still provide some protection during the day. Beyond just your home, know what is happening in your neighborhood and community. Stay in the well trafficked areas if you have to venture out during the day. Second week. So again, I don't think the police are going to be there at the end of the first week. Man, if you're out cruising around town looking for food, just like all the other million people in your town or your city, um, I, I would not be venturing out. You, you got a couple days to get stuff put together, get to your location, and then you, you, you batten down the hatches. You don't, you're not out cruising around. By the second week, crime, looting, and marauding will rise. Stores and pharmacies will have already been looted. Mutual assistance groups will spring up in some communities, neighborhoods, and buildings. These will vary from street gangs to militias to armed citizens. There could be conflicts between these groups, though they will likely be pretty respectful of boundaries in early weeks. Your opportunity to travel has passed. So again, agree with him, 100%. Read Selko Pigovich, The Dark Secrets of SHTF Survival. Uh, he lived through a... A, a, a similar scenario in a modern city uh, that got shut off from electricity during a war uh, and over in Bosnia. And, you know, he talks about how the it broke down like city street by street and, and family by family. And you basically what this does, it starts pushing people into groups. And at first, the groups, like he said, respect each other's boundaries. But eventually, when 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 your pulled resources in your group run out. You have to go after another group's resources. And you end up with these groups fighting, killing each other off, absorbing members, growing, and what you're going to end up with multiple warlords in each city, and you're going to have to live under their roles, and you're going to have to do what they say, and you're going to have to do things that you don't want to do in order to get food from the group. And that's just, that's that's history, and that's what's going to happen. And it may seem crazy in America here, uh, the greatest, richest country in the world, but that's that's human nature, and that's... That's how it will go. Roads impacted by people fleeing population centers will be littered with abandoned vehicles and will be far too unsafe to travel. Many will be living out of their cars on rural land they could get to, and they will suffer being kicked out off that land by locals. International borders will be closed to stop the flood of refugees, and governments will issue stay-at-home orders, curfews, or attempt to relocate people in mass. With no sign of recovery, hospital and emergency workers will turn to their own families and communities. You'll want to keep as low a profile as possible. Make sure the windows are covered. Avoid cooking in lights at night. When cooking, add any spices after flame out to avoid releasing scents into the air. You'll need to purify any water you obtain that isn't part of your stores. Stay put and stay hidden. You'll not find food or medicine anywhere, so there's little point in venturing out. Your solutions for this period are to have the foods and medicine you need in your preps. So... He's right to a degree, but he's he's kind of tipping his hat to people that plan to stay in the city. Oh, board up your windows and doors, cook. Your neighbors are never going to figure out that you're cooking food or, or that you're boarding up your, your doors. And Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to tip my hat to people that want to stay in the city in an extended blockout scenario because you, it, it's it's just not realistic to think your neighbors aren't going to figure out real quick what's going on over your house if you formed relationships with your neighbors now is the time to start discussing food rationing and how you'll work together if you're not prepared okay so again if you're the only prepper on the street and you've got a year's worth of food for your family and like that's the whole thing all the books that talk about suburban prepping like oh we're gonna we're gonna block off our street we're gonna join forces we're gonna garden we're gonna grow food you're the only one with food. You've got a year's worth of calories for four people. Now your group just grew to the 20 or 30 people on your in your apartment building or on your cul-de-sac. Those 20 people are going to eat through your one year's worth of calories for your family. 
within a couple of weeks. You're never going to make it to harvest season. You're, you're never going to make it to, 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 to the next point of feud. All you've done is given other people your kids' food. Um, so this idea of a mutual assurance group in a neighborhood when nobody else has prepped and you're the only prepper and you're going to, this, this group, they're going to eat your food. It's just period. That's, that's a fact. You're not, just because you own it, you're not going to be able to keep them from coming to you to get food. And they're going to ask, they're going to beg, they're going to plead, they're going to get angry. And eventually there's more of them than you. They will take it by force. At this point, you've all decided to hunker down. So you're all in it together. Never reveal all your supplies, but it will be crucial for you to have a large supply of food stored as you may be the only resources your neighbors have. Always barter a cup of beans or rice or a couple of ramen noodle packets for things you know you will need in the weeks ahead. This is terrible advice. Terrible advice. Bartering short term in the immediate aftermath of a long term grid down event. If you're bartering, if you, you, you know, they don't have anything. Uh, so what if they have something, you know, a flashlight that you want or, you know, some certain ammunition that you maybe you're low on? I mean, what are you bartering for? If, you, if you're a prepper and you have this stuff, all you're doing is tipping your hat to that other person. You're just showing them that you have stuff. You're just relying on the fact that they're going to stay a good citizen and that, that you can call 911 when they come to take your stuff by force. You should not be showing anyone ever, period, you know, Treat it like Fight Club. You don't talk about it. Um, this idea of bartering your way through a grid down collapse in the immediate aftermath is a death warrant, in my opinion. Thanks for watching my video. If you like this kind of content, please consider going down and hitting the like and subscribe button so you can be notified as new videos are released. If you'd like to see the full length review of this video, you can follow me up Patreon at Jonathan Hollerman.